Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Robert Rivera with Who's On First, this show. And today I have a very special guest. It's an honor for, for me to even have her on my show. And Lois, she is a uh, played at the All-American Girls Baseball League. Well, my name is Lois Youngin. I just turned the big 9-0. Whoa, 9-0. God bless you. <laughs> there aren't many of us left. Well, I played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Now, how do you like that for something you can't pronounce? <laughs> uh, and I played from 1951 to 1954. I played basically for two teams, the Fort Wayne Daisies and the South Bend Blue Sox. Okay. When we say the All-American Girls Baseball League, everybody goes to that famous movie, A League of Their Own. My question to you is, that movie, did it portray kind of what you, you ladies were going through? Well, I would say it's about 75% accurate. The other 25% is Hollywood hyperbole. <laughs> it's what we needed to bring the fans into the seats, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have this picture behind me, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what team this is. My son put this up. I think these are the... the Springfield Sallies. Sallies. There you go, the Sallies. One on my left, that would be your right on the corner, is one of the Cook twins. Okay. We had two sets of twins that played in the league during my four years, and not even Hollywood could reproduce that. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so what position did you play? I was a catcher primarily the last year 54 I played a lot in the outfield because we had a catcher and we needed an outfielder and my manager Bill Allington thought I was quick enough and had a good enough arm that I could play left field okay so I did and and enjoyed it okay now for for your for, for those who don't know me and Miss Lotus had a conversation prior to this meeting and uh there was there was a word that would she said, if you want to get me angry, call me a what? What would I call you? A softball player. What? I would never. How dare I? How <laughs> dare I? I would never call you a softball player. It's just terrible. You're a baseball player. So if somebody said, hey, you throw like a girl. <clears throat> I'm assuming the stereotype of throwing like a girl is someone that throws like a shot put. It gets put out there. It's not thrown. So... <laughs> Listen, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my experiences, if you want, for the yes, four years. absolutely. In 1951, I spent most of the year on the bench because we had two other catchers. But the manager of our team was Max Carey. And Max Carey is a Hall of Famer. I think he was an outstanding base stealer and played for the Pittsburgh Pirates. In 1952, my manager was the great all-time slugger, double X, Jimmy Fox. Oh, wow. And he only managed the one year, 1952, and I was fortunate enough to play for him. Now, for those folks that are old enough to have read the reviews of the movie, A League of Their Own, that came out in 1992, which is, you know, quite a while ago. Right. You would have have read that the character of Jimmy Dugan, played by Tom Hanks, was a thinly veiled Jimmy Fox. Okay. And they portrayed him in the movie as being a falling down drunk. And he redeems himself, actually, at the end, which we all loved. But the Jimmy Fox I played for was nothing at all like the Tom Hanks character in the film. In fact, I guess he would be classified as a functioning alcoholic. And if you know anything or remember anything from your personal health 101, you'll know that functioning alcoholics do function like other people right. without any changes throughout their lifetime. So for those who would think that Jimmy Fox was accurately portrayed in the film, let me tell you, my Jimmy Fox never missed a game. He always coached at first base. He always tipped his hat. He never missed the bus. He never drank anywhere in front of us. He'd take batting practice once or twice during the whole season reluctantly, and he put it over our fence, over a pasture field, onto a four-lane highway, so he still had a lot of zip. We loved him. We adored him. Every chance I get to stand up for him since he passed away many years ago, I want people to know that um, he wasn't the uh, Tom Hanks, Jimmy Dugan character in the film. 
Right. So right. that that I hope will uh, straighten out some of the misconceptions about the Jimmy Fox Double X. Okay. All right. That's that's great. That's amazing stuff there. What are your fondest memories? I was fortunate enough to catch one of only two perfect games that were ever thrown in the league. There you go. And my pitcher just passed away a few months ago at age 97. Her name was Jean Fout. She was the goat of our league. And she pitched both of those perfect games. The league lasted for 12 years. So during a 12-year period. And there was a period there when the game actually started as modified softball and it morphed into sidearm throwing and then it morphed into overhand throwing. And every time, and I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, but the ball changed size at the same time. So every time the ball changed size, throwing motion from the pitcher changed, then they had to change the distances to the bases and in the outfield. So over a 12 year period, I think there might be six or seven changes in ball size, which made the game change accordingly. And obviously one of the reasons is to make it more interesting for the fans that come back season after season. And one of my theories is that our managers, most of whom played at least minor league baseball and then some major leaguers as well, could see that the gals had the ability to make the game very much like Major League Baseball. So we changed the game accordingly. But I'm sure money was probably the major mover. Okay. In other words, get more fans to come. Right. But at the same time, I think the managers could promote that by saying these gals are capable of playing Major League Baseball. The ladies are still playing today, correct? Yes, and um, you need to know that on November 17 through 19 of this month at the Baltimore Orioles Ed Smith Stadium in Sarasota, the best women baseball players in the United States will be playing okay. at Ed Smith Stadium where the Orioles have their minor leaguers or their, their spring training, I believe. There is a, a website you can go to to find out more about it. And to I think if you're a baseball fan, if you live within 200 miles, I think you ought to go see these gals play baseball. Okay. Anyway, the website is americangirlsbaseball.org. All right. So these ladies are still playing out there. We're going to post the uh, the website there. And yeah, uh, baseball is baseball. And you're going to see the best women players in the United States. Absolutely. And they'll be playing next year in the world championships. And I'm not sure where those are going to be. But baseball in the world is played by women in 29 countries. They are divided into geographical areas. Okay. So you have to win your area in order to move on. And last summer in August, our women destroyed every team they played against in Canada, where they determined the, who moves forward. And I think we beat Canada and Mexico, and I'm not sure who the third team was, to be honest with you. All right. Anyway, one of the scores was 37 to something. So oh, boy. you might be interested in knowing who has been perennially one of the best in the world. Women's okay. base have one of the best women's baseball teams in the world. Let us know, Lois. Let us, let us know. Who is it? Japan. Japan. Oh. And you can understand that because after World War II, we were there as an occupying force in Japan and American men brought baseball with them. So baseball has fared very well, as you well know, with the number of Japanese men that play in our major leagues. Yeah, so, with, the w, with the WBC this year, I was there. Japan took, took the WBC. They took the first WBC also. So, But you need to come and see them play. Yeah, we got we to we gotta get out there and support these ladies. They don't have quite the challenges that we had when we played. You know, we played in a one-piece dress. Oh, yeah. How was, I don't know how if you remember that, but we played in a one-piece dress. Yeah. And we slid on our bare skin. And as one of my friends over the years has said, and she's over 90, I'm still picking pebbles out of my thigh. <laughs> well, I remember in the movie, I can't play in that. And I remember Dottie Henson. 
said, I got a squat in that. You kidding me? That's right. That's the line. <laughs> well, the league lasted for 12 years and we played in that dress all 12 years. The only thing that happened was the dress got shorter. Oh, the dress got shorter. Wow. By, by the time I got there, we had a mini skirt with tights underneath. So you could at least spread your legs to feel the ground ball <laughs> without getting skirt. The, the ladies that you played with, I'm sure there were some interesting people, some some ladies that used to do some interesting things. What was, what was the things that some of the, your teammates used to do? Well, probably the thing that was the most fun is when we traveled, we traveled by bus, which you saw in the movie. And sometimes since we played seven days a week with doubleheaders on Sunday, 110 games during the summer, when we traveled by bus, we sang a lot. <laughs> and we were very good at singing. Uh, we would harmonize. We sang all the old songs, the camp songs, and all the popular songs. Okay. Um, I know uh, that we had one player that used to come into the dugout, and she would come in and then lower herself as she came in. So if you were on the outside looking in, you would see her head go down and down and go below the I don't know where that came from, but that's something that, that she did. No, we weren't much into coffee making and crocheting. Um, and because we lived in private homes when we were at home, we really didn't see much of each other except at the ballpark. And when we traveled, we stayed in the best hotels that these small towns had to offer. Okay. So when I played, we, we, we went to... Um, Kalamazoo, Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Fort Wayne, Indiana, South Bend, Indiana, Peoria, Illinois, the Peoria Red Wings, and then there was the infamous Rockford Peaches. And I think your viewers should know we still hate the Rockford Peaches. <laughs> Those peaches, I tell you, there's something else, huh? Right. <laughs> so who was the toughest pitcher that you have to face out there? Well, I, the one that pitched the perfect game pitched against us when I played with Fort Wayne. And uh, I would say she was by far the best pitcher in the league. Fort Wayne had a good pitcher named Maxine Klein. It's kind of interesting, you know, our, our signals were the old kind. One for a fastball, two for a curve, oh. three for a changeup, and a fist for a pitch out. Okay. Um, and we called our own games, which which is the way it ought to be. But that's right. That's not either here nor there. But um, I agree with but, you wholeheartedly, Lewis. You no, know, this business of, of knowing – analytics as far as i'm concerned should go out the window and we should go back to having players decide what they're going to do with the ball when they get it i'm with you i'm with you 100 percent. all right i mean so what was that what was the farthest you ever hit a ball i hit one home run over the fence and the gal that i hit it off of is still alive and kicking there aren't many of us that are by the way there were 260 women that played in the league at least one game over the 12 year period that the league existed. And now we're down to about 40 players that are still actively involved. Uh, the problem is we only see a handful of them that can come to a reunion or can go to what used to be Fan Fest, which was held in conjunction with, you know, Major Leagues Baseball's All Star game. Right. The problem right now is of that 40, we don't know how many of them are physically disabled, you know, in wheelchairs, et cetera, or how many of them are with us mentally. Okay. So, um, um, as I said, we're down to a handful. I, now, and, I, um, I know you guys were, were put into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And what, were you, what, what did that mean to you to be recognized and placed into the Baseball Hall of Fame? I don't like to use the word inducted because we never were inducted. No, we never... are not privy to putting H of F on anything. All right. Yes. We have an exhibit in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and it includes a listing of all the women that ever played in the league. And there are some autographs, I mean, some um, photographs of uh, some of the early players. I guess it, how can I say that? Certainly it was. A, a, a great feeling of knowing that at least we were in the Baseball Hall of Fame in part, and we were there as a group. We were there as a total league. They didn't try to single out any of the individual players. And that was one of the things that our early board members, we have a players association, and the early board members of that players association were the ones that said, look, if we're going to be in the Hall of Fame in any way, 
we want to be sure we come in as a group because we're a finite 12 years worth and everybody deserves to have their name there if they played at least one game. So it was out, it's outstanding. I have seen the exhibit you know, three or four times now and we have had our reunion in Syracuse, New York two or three times and every time we've been there we have been privileged to go over to the Baseball Hall of Fame and a gentleman there by the name of Tim Wiles, who isn't with them anymore, except in spirit. But I mean, he's not dead. Don't misunderstand. He just has another job. Yes. Anyway, he was very instrumental in getting us into the Hall of Fame and as our, our mentor, I guess you would say. And so we have been able to see our own exhibit more than once. We take a bus, we go to Syracuse, have our reunion and always spend a day down at the Cooperstown at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And they've always been very, very nice to us. We usually have a bit of a, a, a show and tell with some of the players answering questions and so on. Jimmy Fox is there. You get to see his, what would you call it, his plaque? And you get to see um, Dan, uh, Bancroft, which his first name. And I'm old. I can't remember names. Uh, <laughs> Dave Bancroft is there. He was a manager in the league. And I think there's one other Hall of Famer that was one of our managers over the 12 year period of time. Okay. All right. Who was one of the heavy hitters? People that, that like teams or, or a hitter, particular hitter you never wanted to face? Well, um, I played with probably the best hitters in the league. <laughs> uh, so uh, being only five foot three and most of them being a foot taller than I am, they managed to swing a pretty good sized bat. Joe Weaver played center field and hit 400. Okay, wow. And her sisters, Betty Weaver Foss and her other sister, Jean. Okay. And they all three played for Fort Wayne and they all could run like gazelles. And they all could swing the bat like Jimmy Fox. Wow. So we played with a 10 inch baseball rather than a nine inch. And I am not sure. I think the emphasis was always on base running. And so the idea was uh, to get on base and then we'd have double steals and we'd have hit and run. We even stole home, uh, which is rare in baseball today. Although yeah. I think somebody did it this year. I'm not sure. Okay. One of the major leaguers. But anyway. I suppose if we had known more about baseball construction or if the managers did, they would have juiced the balls a little bit. So we could have done a little bit better with the home run ball. Okay. The other thing you need to know is we had lots of challenges. We played in a dress. All right. We wore metal spikes, which meant you could get spiked. We did not have batting helmets, which means you could get hit. We did not have women's equipment. We had men's bats, which means, and men's catcher's equipment, which meant that I was duct taped back together. I tore my catcher stuff apart and duct taped them back together. Otherwise, the shin guards would have been up to my waist, practically. Oh, wow. <clears throat> now, the next thing is the bat. The fellow that won the home run contest this year, and I wrote this down, used a 34-inch bat that weighed 31 and one half ounces. We used men's bats. We did not go to Louisville Slugger and say, I want 55,000 dozen of such and such a bat with my name on it. Right. So we walked into a place like Dick's Sporting Goods okay. and we bought whatever bats they had and the bats were made for men. So we had 35 and 36 inch long bats. If we could find a 33, we were in heaven. And they had big fat handles. And if I'd have been Ted Williams, I'd have worked on those handles every day to slim them down. <laughs> and they weighed 35 ounces or 34 ounces. Now, this is before we realized how important bat speed is, which it is today. Right. But we didn't have strength training. We didn't work out. And uh, we were pretty much stuck with the strength that we came into the league with. So for me... I spent all my time hunting for a bat that I could swing, one that was light enough, had a small enough grip, and weighed as little as possible. Okay. So I am surprised that I played as well as I did with the equipment we had. 
Okay. Um, if we would had equipment like the women have today, I think we would have been uh, considerably better. Again, the emphasis was primarily on base running from the very beginning because the game started as modified softball, but you could lead off and you could steal. This is 1943, all right? Underhand pitching. We didn't start shifting to overhand till 46 sidearm or 47 and 48, we were over throwing overhand. So in addition to that, we played on fields that even our little leaguers wouldn't play on today. When it rained in Fort Wayne, they poured gasoline on the infield and they lit it and they burned off the water. And then we had to play in it and slide in it. Not, not, not the best conditions. We had no team doctor. We had no athletic trainer. Well, we didn't have any steroids either. So maybe that's the positive. <laughs> Anyway, we had quite a few challenges, and I'm always, when I look back, I'm surprised we played as well as we did. Okay. So, I mean, so if you had to do it all over again, would you do it all over again? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you I could mean, still play today, I'm sure you'd, you'd be a there, fire out there. There isn't a gal that played that, that, that I know of that wouldn't say they would have played for free. Yeah. You know, yeah. And they just yeah. loved the game that much. Yeah. So that's, well, that's speaking, why they played. Of money, how much, how much did you make to play? Well, the, the stars of the league, um, and there were some, Gotti Kamenchek, who played first base for the infamous Rockford Peaches, and uh, Gene Fout, who was the GOAT, who was the pitcher that pitched the perfect game that I was fortunate enough to catch when I was with South Bend in 1953. Uh, and uh, Dottie Schrader, who had the pigtails and blonde, tall blonde, played shortstop and was a defensive whiz. Um, those are three off the top of my head that I can think of that probably made a hundred to one hundred and twenty dollars a week wow. in their heyday. I made fifty dollars a week, and I made enough to pay my college tuition for four years. I played for four years. Okay, what what did you do? What was your major in college? I was in physical education. You either were a teacher or you were a nurse. You know, back in those days, I grew up before television, Robert. <laughs> I'm, I'm old as dirt. As before television. Oh, my Lord. Right. I, 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 to be honest with you, Lois, I got a touch of it. I used to go to Puerto Rico every summer to go visit my grandparents. And in Puerto Rico, the TV was on from 12 o'clock in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night. And that was your TV. So if you got up early in the morning, you would go get the paper, some bread, have coffee, and you would sit around listening to the radio until 12 o'clock. And then there was actually only two or three channels. There were actually, and one was news, one was a little entertainment, and one was something else. I don't remember. But there wasn't really much on. So I, I got a taste of no TV uh, after <laughs> after going, going to Puerto Rico for the summer. So it was more of a, you're going to go outside, you're going to go play, you're going to have fun, you're going to go out there. You're going to go chase chickens around. I, I'm I'm old enough to say that I remember no TV. I remember listening to a baseball game on the radio with my grandfather. Yes. And That's Tony true. Perez, Tony Perez got a game winning double in that game. I remember that. That was great. <laughs> so what was one of your favorite places to visit? Well, we didn't have too much free time. You know, we played every night. Okay. So you travel and we played uh, and we had to travel by bus. So you traveled by bus. You got in midday uh you got your hotel room uh you had something to eat you changed it into your uniform and then you got back on the bus to go to the ballpark and then after the game you came back to the hotel you were there part of the next day possibly and um if it was sunday a lot of the gals went to church i visited museums i was the outcast i guess i <laughs> <laughs> uh, I looked around for other other kinds of things to do, but we'd often go to the movies because the movies were the only uh, entertainment we had since we didn't have TV. Uh, and there was we were always in a hotel that was kind of downtown in the cities that we were in. Okay. So we could go to a movie, a matinee, and still get back to eat and get dressed in time to go to the ballpark. Okay. So I would say that our primary type of entertainment was going to the movies. Going to the movies. All right. How about those umpires? Were they good umpires or? I don't know if you remember in the in the movie, A League of Their Own, there's an epilogue where you see we old gray haired gals out there trying to run and throw the ball around, you know? Yeah. And there's a, Janie Crick was a big, tall redhead. And there's a, a scene where the umpire calls a strike on her 
and she turns around she's a little taller than he is and she looks right down her nose at him they're nose to nose you know <laughs> and the umpire said yesterday it might have been a ball and tomorrow it might be a ball but today it's a strike so um our umpires were really quite good and we didn't talk as I didn't as a catcher didn't talk much to the umpires. If I did, I never looked at them. I was just straight ahead, like you missed that one, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I suppose you could kick a little bit of dirt back at him once in a while. Oh man! Oh wow! This that must have been fun. All right. I mean, so it, was there any bizarre plays that you were involved in? A crazy rundown, a triple play, something like that. Yeah, no, I know that, you said the one hitter. You said, I mean, you said the no hitter. There was a no hitter that you were no, in. I caught a perfect game. Oh, perfect game. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Let's get it straight, Rob. Uh, okay. No one got to first base. That's so, right. Okay. So, what do I remember? I remember that Jean struck out eight. She had eight put outs. I caught eight put outs. Uh, I remember one, only one, two balls that got out of the infield, actually. And one was uh, Betty Wagner, who was playing either right field or center field, I'm not sure, that night, made a, a nice catch, a nice running catch that, that could have gone either way. And then I remember not talking about it on the bench because we didn't want to jinx our pitcher That's or right. anyone else, so we didn't talk about it. So those are about the only things that I that I remember about that game. Okay. You know, I only played for four years, and there's a lot of things happened in between. And the movie wasn't made till 1992, and the league folded in 1954. Right. So, you know, I mean, a lot of living uh, <laughs> was in a... was in between there. But my hat's off to Penny Marshall. Anybody that's seen the movie A League of Their Own should um, thank Penny for making a bunch of scar starlets look like ball players because <laughs> Penny wasn't going to have any of them in her film unless they could look like they knew about baseball because Penny Marshall knew baseball. She was an avid collector of memorabilia and she was an avid fan. You could see her in her later years um, courtside at the LA Lakers games, the pro basketball. She had a seat on the sidelines there. Okay. And uh, she uh, she was a sports fan through and through. And as I said, she wasn't going to have anybody in this film that didn't look like they could throw a ball or catch a ball or swing the bat. So once she decided on who she wanted in her film, well, she, she quipped once before the game, before the filming started, that once the, the young starlets in Hollywood found out that she was going to make a film and she needed actresses that could play baseball. She said there was not a batting cage in all of Orange County that didn't have actresses in there trying to hit a baseball. <laughs> so, uh, once she decided on that, once selected her team, so to speak, right. they worked out for a year with the assistant baseball coach at the University of Southern California. Okay. So uh, they had to be trainable. They, they had to be trainable or she wasn't going to have them in the film. Okay. So, and then you add some movie magic and you have um, Rosie O'Donnell fielding the ball at third base. And she picks up the ball and she makes the throw. The camera does not follow the ball all the way to the first baseman. What you see is a see or throw it. Then right. there's the cutout. And the next thing is you see the first baseman stretching forward to catch the ball. And somebody's four feet away outside the camera range tossing the ball. So we had some movie magic there that not for everything, but for uh, quite a few things. Um, the majority of the gals played a pretty fair game and looked like they could throw and looked like they could hit and looked like they could catch, even though there was a little bit of movie magic involved. Now, the one thing that did happen, and I don't know how Madonna got into the film, now, Madonna in there must have been 25% of the Hollywood hyperbole. So <laughs> they put in one scene so she could show off her dance moves. I don't know if you remember, they went to a place called yeah. the Suds Bucket and they did yeah. this dancing business and mm -hmm. Madonna got to show off. Now, in return, Penny Marshall asked Madonna to slide head first into third base. 
And she does this at least two times and maybe three, or maybe one of the two times is repeated as you can edit, you know, in and out. We never slid head first. If the major leaguers were sliding feet first, we were sliding feet first. And and Pete Rose hadn't hadn't made it yet to the majors when that happened. So what we got was if you got caught off of first base, which is true now, you slid back into first head first. You're still, I mean, that was standard procedure. Right. But when you slid into second or third or home, it was not hands first with a padding on your hand. Somehow Penny Marshall talked Madonna into sliding head first, and she did it. I don't know if she got extra money for doing that or not, or if she was <laughs> even aware that she was getting paid extra or getting paid or were just doing that as part of her contract. But anyway, that was an interesting part that was something we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done that actually in, in real life. Wow. So, it's, it's a, you're, you're coming up with this amazing stuff. You know what? I got to tell you for 90 years old, you, you have a heck of a mind is I'm 53. And sometimes I walk into a room and I don't even know why I'm there. <laughs> well, some days are better than other, Robert. So I want you to know that. <laughs> I, I hope I hope at ninety I'm I'm uh, as coherent as you are. It's it's amazing to me. I, my dad is he's in his seventies, and sometimes he forgets where he's at too. But yeah, God bless you. You still watch the game? Or... I'm 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 pretty disillusioned by Major League Baseball. Number one, they make obscene salaries. Number two, they can't play when they get a hangnail. And and number three is there are only a handful of them that will take time to sign autographs for kids. Now, if you want to promote baseball, fellas, you guys that play, part of your job is taking time to visit with the young kids and supporting them and signing autographs for them. Mm. Okay? Mm. I don't like analytics. It takes all the decision making and puts it in the manager's hand i guess or the man or the coaches or whoever makes the decisions but when you think of it for junior high or middle or middle school or high school age kids they should be making these decisions for themselves that's what learning is all about <laughs> and you can't if you're just a pawn out there doing what somebody's telling you to do so well the other thing is the obscene amount of money it costs a family of four to go see one major league game the time you buy four tickets, you buy four hot dogs. You know, hot dog costs ten bucks. Yeah. Uh, at a major league ballpark. Yeah. And if you're going to have something to drink, pretty soon you're you've paid out two hundred and fifty dollars to go to one game. Where happened to the old three bucks and sit in the bleachers idea? Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm we're greedy. I guess is what I'm trying to say. The owners are greedy, and a lot of the ball players are greedy. I'm not a big fan of any professional sport. I'm. I'm a fan of college sports because the kids play because they love it and they know they're not going to 80% or 90 not going to make it beyond college. So they make the most of their time. Right, right. So if a, if a young lady or a young man came up to you and said, hey, I want to be a professional baseball player, what advice would you give them? Well, first would be make sure you've got a backup plan and get a good education. If you have a college scholarship, make sure you get an education and that you graduate and get that degree. And then go for your goal with all the passion you have in your heart and your mind. Go for it. Give it all, but have a backup. And I always say get a good education. Okay. All right. I mean, have you ever been recognized out in the supermarket? Oh, there, that's the lady that played in the baseball league. Yes, occasionally here in Oregon. Yes, in Eugene. Yes, I have. <laughs> and then, yep. Now, I know you've been to Cooperstown. Who? Who was the people that you met? Some of those, I'm sure those Hall of Famers, I'm sure you've bumped into over there. Let's see, 2013 and 2014, I was the women's representative. I was the token woman for a Ken Burns event that he had at Cooperstown. And people paid an obscene amount of money to come for three days and talk and meet with um, Ozzy Smith, and uh, myself, which I'm laughing about, uh, Ozzy Smith and um, Phil Necro was okay. the other the other major. Those were the two major leaguers that were there. And there was an, another major leaguer that was there, and he worked a little t for a little while with with ESPN. And he, I think, was an outfielder, and I can't remember his name because 
Ozzie Smith and Phil Negro were names. He's not a hall. This fellow's not a hall of famer, but um, he was someone that obviously the Ken Burns event group wanted to have there. They divided the folks into into groups of four, like the Babe Ruths and the such and such and so on, and they rotated them around so they could hear different ones of us speak. And uh, then we went out to Double Bay Field. And uh, Necro threw up, threw up some lobs, lobbed up some balls, and the people that were there, which were fans, obviously, and if they wanted to be involved, they put on their batting helmet and get out there and take a swing. And we actually played a few innings. Okay. So uh, it wasn't what you'd call baseball, but you could go home and say, "I swung the bat and hit a ball off of Phil Necro." <laughs> and Ozzy Smith would do a backward flip down at shortstop. So wow, yeah. I got to talk to Ozzy Smith quite a bit because I rode with him in the limousine from Albany down to Cooperstown. And he reminisced fondly about the time he spent in some, I'm, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. Right. I've been here for 60 years. So he talked about playing in the Pacific Northwest League and how much he enjoyed it. So we talked about, about that a little bit. Quite an interesting and... Um, extraordinary experience for me to be be the the token woman i shouldn't call it token i guess but the okay. woman representative okay. um representing women's baseball i mean I, I i see your 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 energy when you talk about the women's baseball i love it i see you promoting it and and the love that i i i'm i want to go see the women play now i'm excited i'm going to go take a look i'm going to try to figure out how to get down there and watch these young I ladies. think it would be well worth your time. I was the, this is the second classic. This is the second year. And this year I just couldn't go it you can't from where I live in Eugene, Oregon, it takes two airports. <laughs> five you know, yeah, get five there. Miles, three, yeah, I know. 3000 miles to get to you and <laughs> I I I just can't I can't do that anymore. I'm Absolutely. I'm uh I'm sorry. I would give anything to be there. All I could do is send them a little bit of money to support the gals um, because this AmericanGirlsBaseball.org is a nonprofit. And obviously we make our money by selling t-shirts to each other. Okay. So any kind of, any kind of a donation, any kind of a donation is helpful. All right. I um, mean, there's going to be guys, there's going to be ladies, gentlemen, there's going to be description below. Make sure you click on that link. We'll get that on there. Lois, I, I miss Lois. I thank you so much. I, I'm so honored for you to come on the show. I appreciate it so much. Uh, been talking about this. I always told my wife, and then all of a sudden, boom, you, you came out of nowhere. And I, I think you were a godsend to me. And uh, it, was, it was a heck of a connection how you came to me. But I, I appreciate you being on. I appreciate you for what you did, playing the game and loving the game and you know, pushing that women can play baseball too. Well, I tell you, there's one thing I'd like to be able to do. Go I'd ahead. like to go out to the M's ballpark. That's our class A team and take a few swings. <laughs> okay. With a, with a 34 inch bat with 31 and a half ounces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure they can make that happen for you. I don't see why not. I don't see why not. I, I think that would be. I, I can't would, run the first base, but I think I can still swing the bat. We can, we can always do Sandlot. We have a designated runner. I okay, remember. that's great. <laughs> yeah, designated runner, right? Right. <laughs> All right, Miss Lois. Well, thank you, Derek. Thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it so much, um, and I definitely will keep in touch with you. I, I wish you a happy birthday, Scorpio thank you. rule. Mine is mine is coming up in a couple of days, and. Uh, uh, Scorpios, we're very passionate about what whatever we're passionate about. That's absolutely, a, absolutely, and uh, we're tough, we're rugged, but we're cuddly bears too. <laughs> well, thank and, you for inviting me. Oh, I hope I've met your goals. Absolutely, no, no, no. You have, you've exceeded. You have exceeded. Absolutely, I appreciate it so much, and uh, I I wish you all the best. I wish you health and uh, another ninety years. What do you think? I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my motto is keep moving and keep laughing. Oh, my motto is keep swinging. As you All right, by the head. right, guys, don't forget, we have merches out there. Keep swinging. All right. And Ms. Lois, can you do me a favor? Oh, yes. You're watching Who's On First with Robert Rivera. And keep swinging.
If you like the show, please do me a favor. Subscribe, right? Right. You see it? It's right there. Subscribe, share, like, and don't forget, put that bell on. And I'll ding you when I put something else on, all right?